Thanksgiving break. We are happy today to have uh, Shuyu, who is going to tell us about the scramble on loops. Okay, uh, thanks for having me there here to uh, give me this chance to give this talk. So uh, today I'm going to talk about some topics about the uh, quantum chaos. And uh, um, so the first thing we need to, or I need to explain is to study quantum chaos, what physical quantity we should look at. And uh, the quantity we are going to focus on today is this quantity called the time order correlation function. And uh, this quantity by now is a standard measure of uh, quantum chaos, both studied in high energy theory and the condensed matter theory. And uh, this quantity is called out of time order correlator because, um, for example, these four operators I now wrote in a contour order way. So they live on this Schrodinger Kurdish contour. And if you go along the contour order, for example, this black dot stands for V operator. This uh, white dot stands for the W operator. And if you go along the contour order way, they are out of time, out of real time order. So this horizontal line is a real time. Um, this quantity is in general very hard to compute, especially in chaotic system. But uh, in certain systems, people were able to compute that. And uh, one example is in larger system. Um, in larger system, in certain time regime, this OTOC is controlled by a very simple mode called scramble mode. And uh, let me try to explain what that means. So roughly speaking, scramble mode is a connective mode that emerge from some larger antibody system or holographic system um, in 0 plus 1D. This mode, uh, actually the OTOC itself is uh, in larger limit, is dominant by such a mode. So you can see typically in 0 plus 1D, which is quantum mechanics, OTOC has this typical behavior. So one term is not that interesting. That's the disconnected part for this four-point function. And the interesting part starts from here. And uh, this is actually the typical behavior for scram models. So this mode, this behavior has shown up in some low dimensional model, for example, S uh, SYK model and uh, JT graphity, but uh, it's actually more generally true for other graphic body quantum mechanics. Um, in higher dimension, this scram also appears, but there is not that systematic. But we have some example, for example, SYK chain. Uh, I will explain what this thing is later. Uh, for example, also weakly coupled quantum field theory or holography. And uh, as an explicit example, I write down the typical behavior for OTC. Um, uh, if you calculate that for a metabolic system, it is due to ADFQ gravity to holography. So you can see the typical behavior here as uh, exponential growing time and exponential decay in spatial separation. Okay, so let's have a closer look into the interesting part of this uh, OTOC, um, which is uh, the leading, leading connected contribution. And uh, I took the example from uh, from this uh, yeah, geography, and uh, you can draw our heat map. So this is the heat map, the vertical line here is heat, the horizontal line here is that. And the color here, the light color means this quantity is large. The dark color means this quantity is close to zero. So you can see some um, sharp feature here. For example, I draw this uh, solar line defined by this thing equal to say 0 0.9, some quantity, some value close to one. And uh, near that line, you can see this quantity change very sharply. So that's usually what people call the wavefront. But from this heat map, there are some other features. For example, you can draw another line, this dash line. For example, that dash line can be defined by this OTUC equal to 0 0.2. Okay, so there is some separation between these two lines. And uh, for this behavior, you can see the separation between these two lines. They basically keep the same when you go along this wavefront. 
So in that sense, people usually say the wavefront in ADS gravity is sharp. Okay, so that's a calculation from the larger system. But uh, there are uh, some other calculations from our smart colleague from this matter part. Actually, one of them is sitting in the audience. Uh, they, can, they have some other toy models to compute this quantity. For example, the random unitary circuits, uh, the Brownian circuit cluster. And for those systems, they were actually able to compute um, for some finite but large. And uh, this is a uh, heat map from their result. You can again plot the same quantity equal to 0 0.9 at this solar line. You can plot that quantity equal to 0 0.2 at this dash line. And you can see there is a sharp difference between this heat map and that heat map because the separation between this line, two lines, become wider and wider as you go along the wavefront. So this problem was uh, called the wavefront broadening problem. And what this result out of implies is the fluctuation or one way fluctuations or quantum fluctuations could have a very significant effect on scrambling. And uh, in quantum field theory, usually fluctuations are related with loop diagrams, in Feynman diagram. So let's try to look at possible loop diagrams in this theory of scrambling. And uh, for our purpose, we would like to focus on near squabbling time. So let's first make some kind of uh, crude or wild guess based on the rough behavior that squabbling exponential growth in time. So in zero plus one D quantum mechanics, these two terms are the terms we just mentioned. And what could be the next loop correction? One simple case is you just have two squabbling modes exchange. And you can have more of them. And uh, you can convince that if this squamblon field has an exponential growing time behavior, this basically is the most dominant loop diagram by this order. Because it, uh, you gain a lot of contribution by trying to stretch this propagator as long as possible. Good. So this is a possible loop correction in 0 plus 1D. And uh, by looking at this behavior, you might be worried about this series because um, for single square lambda is one over n times e to t, two is this thing square, three square lambda is like this thing cube. Um, but if you look at slightly late time, for example, t of order log n, then this quantity could be slightly larger than one. So naively, this series will not converge. And you would think these uh, quantum correction so is very dangerous because it's basically cause your perturbation breakdown. But it turns out we are kind of lucky. Uh, well, it's not really piece of luck. It's, uh, there is a physical reason. We are lucky in the sense that this series is actually an alternating series. So they can actually be resumed. And uh, for some explicit uh, quantum mechanical model, for example, SYK model, you get some hypergeometric function as a result. It doesn't matter what this uh, precise function is, but roughly its, re its uh, behavior is like this function here. So when t is small, we expand this term, we get the one plus that piece, or one minus that piece. And at late time, when t is large, this one will just, this quantity will just converge to zero. And uh, typically, this resummation actually means your system has a finite dimension Hilbert space. So it, this uh, OTOC cannot keep growing. Okay, so we would say this corrections in zero plus one D as safe, and almost defining what I mean by safe, are safe corrections in two senses. So in the first sense, they do not cause the single scrambler approximation to break down early. What I mean is if you look at time scale where this guy is small compared to one, then the remaining piece can never be bigger than that. So this, uh, these corrections will not cause the approximation given by the single score model to break down earlier than uh, when it uh, becomes or the one itself. And the second reason why it's uh, safe is because, well, you know how to resume this uh, series. So it can be systematically, systematically treated. And uh, 
this structure is not just special in some quantum mechanical model. They actually have a analog in gravitational high energy scattering called the Icarno resummation. Um, good. So that's the story for the O plus 1D. We have a very systematic treatment, but uh, for future um, purpose, that'd be slightly more detailed. So usually when people describe some so you, when you uh, wrote uh, OTOC, uh, you said one plus uh, this exponential over n, yeah, plus dot dot dot. So what's the order of this dot dot dot? Because good. So this oh sorry, this, this yeah. these are the thing in the dot dot dot. So ah, so the next term is well then I see the t whole thing squared, and okay. the next one is this whole thing cubed, and plus dot is like this whole thing to the fourth, to the fifth, to the sixth. That's the leading contribution. That's how they start the dot behavior. Uh, good, good. So um, usually when people try to describe some dynamical property in quantum system or quantum field theory, people would like to describe it by defining uh, typical time scales. So for the current problem, in principle, you can define three different time scales. One time scale, usually people call scrambling time. That's when the whole series, after you sum it, uh, becomes order one. It's like the exact answer of OTC become order one. That's usually what people call, people call scrambling time. There is another time called one scrambling time. One scrambling time is uh, when the single scrambling propagator become order one. And there is another time scale called breaking time. Breaking time is when the correction are of the same order of the free level answer. And uh, you can convince yourself, or we can convince ourselves, in the plus 1D, these three time scales are roughly the same. Because everything happens at uh, t of order log n, roughly. Um, so that will be our those order understanding for this dy dynamical process. Um, at least we convince ourselves in the plus 1D. Okay, so now let's go to one higher dimension. In one plus one D, and uh, without talking about some concrete model, let's try to make some um, guess based on the simple, uh, on simple phenomenological behavior of this scrambling problem. Let's say it's, it uh, grows exponentially in time, and this propagator decays exponentially in spatial separation. Then we can also study the loop diagram on top of this uh, level answer. And uh, we can see that this loop diagram could be dangerous correctness. Let me explain what does dangerous correction mean. Then, then it's dangerous in the sense that it would force a single square block approximation to break down early. So suppose we are in a uh, sorry, suppose we are in the time regime where this single squamular contribution to OTUC is still much smaller than one. Then let's tr try to look at uh, these loop diagrams. I'm trying to I'm going to convince you that uh, this loop diagram can be even larger than that. Because that's because, for example, we can consider, for example, this diagram where the propagation is going to and uh, it propagates in the intermediate red point with one scrambler. Then they have there is some scrambler interactions. And from the red dot to the final destination, there are multiple scrambler exchange. So what's the, what the behavior from, for the propagator from this red dot to the final destination? Well, now you have multiple scrambler. It uh, exponentially grow in time much, much faster. It also decays in space much faster. But uh, you can get a huge gain for this diagram by trying to move this red dot as close as in space separation to the final destination and as far as uh, uh, you can in time direction compared, compared to the, uh, the final destination. So if you try to do that, then you gain a lot from the exponential growth in this region. But you only pay a little bit penalty from the exponential decay of this region. So this diagram could potentially be even larger than that guy. Um, 
because you can just make more and more and more loops in this region and try to gain more and more from the exponential growth. Okay, so um, this is just some some guess, but uh, let's try to find a visualization of this uh, scrambler theory. Do some calculation to check if uh, this is really the case. That is a correction could be uh, could cause the single scrambler approximation to break down early. And uh, um, at the beginning, we motivate this problem by compare two results, one result from some gravity, one result from some model like random circuit. And uh, we sort of believe these two theory are quite different theories. And uh, it will be nice if we can find a theory that can interpolate between them and we can study what happened. One such candidate is uh, string theory. Um, Unfortunately, string theory is a bit too hard for me. Maybe it's not too hard for the people in the audience. So today I'm going to formulate the calculation using a toy model called the SYK model or a generalization of SYK model. But uh, during the discussion, we will see that the result or the discussion today will not rely on this specific model. And it's actually valid for more general system. And uh, what we're going to see is when you go from on the theory space, when you go from the right to the left, the behavior of quantum fluctuations or these corrections can change qualitatively, not only quantitatively. And there is a sharp difference between two types of uh, scrambling. One type you would uh, describe that using the, these words as high temperature or a string dominant or incoherent scrambling. We're going to explain this word later. And uh, the other type of scrambling theory is uh, attached with uh, low temperature, with gravitonic change, or pole dominant and coherent. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about this uh, calculation using a concrete model. And uh, uh, this model is a generalization of uh, what people will use of the SYK model. SYK model itself is a zero plus one D quantum mechanics. This one has a spatial structure. This is a model studies in this paper. Uh, actually, also there's a picture I steal from that paper. So this model is a strongly interacting fermion system. And uh, you have a 1D lattice. On each lattice side or each unit cell, you have N Majorana fermions. And uh, for the Hamiltonian, there are two types of terms. One type of term, is a p-body interaction within a unit cell. And the other type of uh, term is the intercell interaction term between nearest neighbor unit cell. And uh, this interaction term interacts p over two fermions from this side with p over two fermions from that side. And uh, these j's are the coupling constant and uh, they are independent Gaussian random variable. And you can see there is a subscript here, x, which means they are independent Gaussian random variable even for different size. And this will simplify our calculation a lot. But uh, we are actually going to make our life even easier by trying to start from this end. From that end, there is an a even simpler model where you put some more structure in this coupling constant. You make this coupling constant Brownian. So this coupling constant now depends on time t. And for different time t, they are also independent Gaussian random variables. OK. Um, to study OTOC, we have to put the system on the following Schrodinger Kurdish contour. So again, this uh, horizontal axis is a uh, real time, Lorentzian time. Um, and on this contour, this system, this Brownian version of uh, Gamma's XYK model can be described by a collective field action. And uh, it's a slightly complicated action, so let's decode that a little bit. This action, the field content for that is this little g field. So this little g field is a field as a function of, it's a, it's a bilocal in time field. It has two time variables. Local in space, it has one spatial number. And it also has this IG 
J indices. These IJ indices stand for different contours. For example, this is I equal to one, this is I equal to two, three, four. So IJ indices are contour indices. And uh, this field um, is related with the physical observables. For example, if you want to co compute a correlation function between two operators consist of PW operators, mm. then this two-point function can be exactly rewritten in terms of this G field. Roughly speaking, this delta W is a conformal dimension when you go to low temperature. Um, so it is actually for, for uh, Brownian SYK or for the general system? This one is for Brownian SYK. Yeah. I have a naive question, but where are the coupling constants sitting here? Uh, uh, the coupling constant, good. So uh, there is a coupling constant here, this, this A. Yes. This A is the ratio between intercell coupling divided by the the uh, roughly the intracell coupling. Mm -hmm. And uh, in principle, you can also have a parameter here, which is like the overall strength of that coupling. I choose that to equal to one, just to simplify the notation. There is another interesting coupling constant here. So if there is an overall one over lambda. This is like the larger end parameter. So lambda here is like, roughly speaking, one over n. Oh, good. So indeed, this is a large end quantum field theory, and which means we can use some larger technique to study it. So uh, our purpose is to try to co compute the connected piece, this interesting time-dependent piece of OQC. So in large end field theory, what do we do? We first co compute the saddle point for this uh, field, for this uh, action. Then we try to expand near the saddle point. And uh, this is how this written in formula works like that. The field is this little h field. And the leading order uh, contribution to the connected piece of OTUC will just be given by this hh correlation function. Remember, this is a bilocal field. So each g is like two fermion operator. So OTUC is like four op fermion operator. That translated like, into h field is like two h field. Good. Um, so you can do this computation, but uh, I will just tell you the result. The result is this HH propagator, tree level HH propagator, is only non zero in the following four configuration on the Schrodinger Kurdish contour. Uh, so it's only non zero when, so this, for example, this black dot stands for one H field, this white dot stands for the other H field. So only non zero when these black and the white dot are separated in the out of time order. So you can try one example. This, in this contour, you first so you in late time white, go back early time black, late time white, early time black. So they are only non zero in this four configuration. And because of that simplification, um, in the later part of this talk, I will just uh, not write this idea in this. And whenever I write a non zero, um, answer for this HH propagator, I mean they are in actually in out of time ordered configuration. And I will just use this uh, wiggly line as a notation for this propagator. And uh, this propagator, you can compute that by it's a one plus one D system with translation symmetry. So you can go first go to momentum space and compute this propagator as an integral over momentum of the momentum space propagator. And from now on, we are going to be generous about how this lambda of p function is. And this thing is called the Lyapunov exponent as a function of momentum. So for different momentum, this mode have different Lyapunov exponent. For Brownian SYK, this lambda L as a function of p is uh, in this form. Uh, for stringy mode in ABS CFT, it's in this form. And uh, for this, this is a high energy community. For this stringy mode, this alpha prime is a string alpha prime. This mu square is because this string propagated in the ADS background, so it gets some curvature fraction. Um, if you just take this stringy mode, then you can just do this integral as the, the HH propagator in real space time will behave something like e to the t minus x square over t. So that's the usual like diffusive behavior in spatial. Uh, the direction. 
So um, we are going to be generous about how this function looks like exactly. Uh, it should be applied uh, for all the theory. But uh, I just want to mention uh, one feature of this integral. This integral is dominated by a set of points on the imaginary axis. So uh, it's dominated by P equal to some I times the real number capital P. And this capital P depends on X over T. So it depends on which base time point you are looking at, this set of point will also change. And of course, this action itself is a very nonlinear action. So there are a lot of interaction terms for this H field. It's actually an arbitrary high order interaction term for this H field. Yeah. Excuse me. Is the relation of this quantum Lyapunov exponent to the classical counterpart? Is there any intuition as some that's a, going away? That's a perfect question. So, um, so uh, one, one, one relation is in classical mechanics, the Lyapunov exponent, you can define that as computing the Poisson bracket. For example, for x at time zero, t at time t, then you compute this score. And this thing has a behavior which have this e to the Lyapunov exponent times t. And you can see this guy is similar to the OTOC in the sense that in quantum system, if you compute the commutator of V0, W of T score, you expand this uh, commutator, there will be four terms. Two of them are time order correlator. Those will decay as a function of time. And the other two out of time order one are the out of time order correlation we're talking about. Um, however, this explanation will be correct for the case we are talking about right now for high temperature case. And later on, when we look at low temperature or graviton case, this intuition is actually not right. But it, it, will, it is right for this case. Um, there are some other computation in this, uh, in this quantum chaos literature where you can see more vividly when you take larger limit, you can go back to the console case matching with this thing called periodic orbit theory. Uh, I would like to, let, let's uh, talk about that maybe after the talk. Good. So, um, good. So we, we just studied this, uh, this theory in at three level. Uh, so let me make some remark. Uh, this one is a concrete example of the squamula field theory motivated at the, um, and the introduction part. Uh, it's an example of high temperature because it's Brownian model. It doesn't have energy con conservation. Uh, it's a model of a high temperature saddle point dominant swam of field theory. And uh, this propagator, as we promised, it's uh, exponential growing time. And it only lives on this fourfold OQC contour. And uh, there is a nice intuitive way to think about this propagator. What this propagator reflects is roughly like an epidemic growth model. So uh, you can check that by uh, checking this HH propagator has a Markovian property. You can truncate this uh, process at some intermediate time, integral over all the possible intermediate state, and then from that intermediate state, uh, propagate to the final point. And they will have this Markovian property. So intuitively, you just you think about this uh, thing as some classical process. That's for intuitions. And uh, to describe this uh, dynamical property of this model, we can still look at the time different time uh, scale we talked about earlier. So for example, we can define the one squam of time. One squam of time it defines for the tree level HH propagator become all the one, so equal to 0 0.9. So we just have the expression and draw it. This is a line, so it's a, a line in the Tx space. So um, early on, we mentioned that there are actually two other possible time scales. Another two will be this scrambling time. Scrambling time is uh, when the full OTOC, this nonlinear resummation, the full OTOC become all the one. And uh, another time scale is this breaking time which is a correction on top of single scramble become larger than single scramble itself. Um, the experience in 2 plus 1D tells us this three times scale should be roughly the same. But
but we also mentioned in, um, in one plus one D, there could be problem. So now let's study the, the problem we motivated. So we were motivated by the fact that these diagrams could be larger than that guy, even when that guy itself is small. So let, since we have this model, let's just try to check if that's correct. So at the field theory, we have to compute for each diagram, then we have to integrate over the intermediate point at the red dot in phase time. And since this is an infinite loop calculation, doing the full computation will be hard, but we can get some intuition or uh, some uh, implication that the fact that remember in zero plus one D, what this summation over multi square line exchange do it is it represents some saturation effect of OTOC. So that's indeed true here. So this summing over that uh, loop diagram, the total result or the total effect will just be a saturating OTOC or uh, from the red dot to the final dot. So something like this. Um, when this red dot and this final dot were in the backward butterfly cone of the final dot, these sum sum over loops will just give you give you a function that almost converge in time. So early on, we motivated that these uh, these higher loops for the second part of this propagation will prefer this red dot to be as close as possible in space dimension to the final destination and as far as it could uh, compared to the final destination. But this resummation effect tells you when you try to move this red dot from here to there, and when it enters the backward butterfly cone of this final dot, this multi-loop will not just keep growing, it will saturate. So when you move this dot from here to there, you wouldn't gain too much from the exponential growth from here to the final destination. But you do pay a little bit of penalty from the propagator from here to there because it decays in space. So eventually the dominant contribution is when this red dot is on the edge of this butterfly cone. And that simplifies our computation a little bit. In the sense that since we know the definition for butterfly cone is the OTOC equal to one. So the propagator from here to there is just one. And the only non-trivial propagator is the propagator from the initial point to this red dot. And that's our tree level HH propagator. So the computation for the all this resummation of the corrections were just reduced to a simple lecture. So you just integral the single gram law propagator from the initial point to, to the red dot along the edge of this cone. Those are the size of the corrections on top of the single gram law. And to study the breaking time, we want to compare that with the single gram law itself. So we, we want to divide this answer by the single square bound answer. And uh, this uh, procedure sounds complicated. So what's intuitively, what's, what we are doing, is you can imagine that uh, what this, this ratio computing is a probability for this particle as a stochastic process or epidemic growth um, for this particle to hit this wall condition on the fact that it will finally propagate to that point. Because whenever you this particle propagate and hit this wall, that means the it's a, the the correction, the loop correction are significant. So that's physically with what we are computing. And you can actually do the computation because we already have this uh, propagator, the the for, the exact form for that. So you just put that in. Then you go to momentum space and you do some subtle point approximation. And 
you enter a bunch of formulas. So these formulas looks complicated. So let's not try to explain how this computation was done, but try to decode this result a little bit more. So first of all, I write this result in a specific form. This T star is a, is a scrambling time or the one scramble time. Right? And I write in the form of the one squam contribution, the tree level contribution itself, can also be written in this form. And you can see it has the, um, the promised property in the sense that when this time is equal to the squamming time, this one becomes for the one. Okay. And this, in this formula, there are two brutal parameters. One parameter is this parameter here. So that's the ratio, or sorry, that's the rate of decay for this function. Another factor is this thing on the denominator, that's the one loop factor. So these two factors, let's denote them as R and L. And these two factors tells us whether or not these errors or these corrections are safe corrections or dangerous corrections. If this R, this decay rate, is always finite. Then we would say the corrections are safe because they will always be exponentially suppressed when the um, when the t is smaller than the scrambling time. So that's before the single scramble become order one. Before the single scramble become order one, this ratio will be exponentially suppressed. But if this parameter is close to zero, then we, we would say this uh, corrections are dangerous because it's a basic out of control. And that's indeed the case for this model. <clears throat> for this model, if you go along this single scramble on naive butterfly cone with, uh, defined by tree level answer equal to one, if you go along this cone, you can see that our parameter go, goes closer and closer to zero. And this one loop factor actually also goes to zero. So that means this ratio actually become very large. So the corrections are actually out of control for this model, indeed, as we expected. And uh, specifically, if you use the uh, Lyapunov exponent for string theory, you will find this, uh, this R parameter decays as a function of x along this cone, along this uh, red line, as a function of x, as one over x. And it's only, it's related with n in this log n, basically. So that's a, that's a story for the high temperature case. And what happens is we need to check that the single scramble approximation breaks down much earlier than the naive expectation. And that somehow means the iconal resummation procedure we did for zero plus one should just not be applied here. And uh, um, this loop diagram give, might give you some uh, feeling that these corrections is enhancing the growth of this single scramble on propagator. But I actually remember we mentioned this series could be alternating side. And that's actually what happened here. These loop diagrams is actually um, counting for the over counting given by the one scramble. So it's actually making the growth slower. And uh, noticing that this is a quite significant breakdown um, for the single scramble approximation. It's usually in larger theory, if you do one over in perturbation theory, the correction will be suppressed by one over it. But you can see this correction is only suppressed by log n. So it's uh, converting to larger also very slowly. And uh, this computation might imply that the scramble on field theory we motivated at the beginning is actually not the best way to describe quantum chaos in this high temperature system. And the better way maybe this uh, as, uh, stochastic as KPP method, uh, actually Sean and uh, Grace Ringo developed uh, several years ago. Okay. So why do we even bother studying this? We have spent half an hour explaining this, uh, this theory. If it's uh, useless, why do we bother? The reason is because eventually we want to go to the low temperature or the gravitational case. And there, 
there's not a method you can use as this FKPP method. And there, the proper method could be, and it's actually is this squamulon field theory. So the reason why we study this field theory carefully is because now we are going to approach the low temperature case and we are going to see there is a huge difference. Okay, so to go to the low temperature case, we have to release one of the simplification we made earlier. Earlier on, we made this coupling constant to depend on time. That stop you from having a conserved energy. So there's no basically no temperature. It's like infinite temperature. So to go to low temperature, we have to recover that. So we remove the time dependence of this coupling constant. And that's the normal uh, SYK or generalized SYK model. And uh, it have a slightly, well, formally it looks similar, but it's slightly different action. Uh, so let me just try to explain what has been changed. What has been changed is first the p level HH propagator. This squamblon propagator gets changed into a more complicated expression. And for today's purpose, actually, all this part, you can just ignore it. It will not be important. And for the first part, there are two features that is important. One feature is you get this C of P function as a one loop contribution. And this C of P function, it has a crucial rule because this C of P function will have a zero on the imaginary axis. And this position of this zero is not a function of X over T. So what happened is if we want to compute the, the HH propagator called squamblon propagator in real space time, you do the Fourier transform. Originally, it's dominated by a saddle point on the imaginary axis. But now we have a pole here. So at some point, when you try to, when you try to use the saddle point approximation, you need to define this uh, deformed contour. At some point, this deformed contour will hit this pole and get a contribution from this pole. And what, that's actually what happened. So for small x over t, the saddle point p is very small, so it's far from this pole. And uh, this whole integral is still approximated by the saddle point. So that's this region here. And for larger and larger x over t, that's when you go along this slide pole further and further, the saddle point will become larger and larger in its value. At some point, it will hit the pole. And uh, after it hit the pole, it gets contribution from both the pole and the saddle point. And the contribution from the pole actually, actually is actually more dominant than the contribution from the saddle point. So here, I draw two lines. The blue line stands for the contribution from the pole. And this red dash line stands for the contribution from the saddle point. You can see the butterfly cone of this contribution, it grows much faster. Than that. Yeah, so what's the, the other dash line? Uh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, this line is a transition line for, and, and the transi transition line when the saddle point P equal to the pole. So it's like in this region, it's dominated by the pole. Yeah. In that region, it's dominated by the side. So, so, so the pole will also, will also change the butterfly velocity? It will. It will. So you can see the velocity for this, the pole line, the solid line is much, actually much faster than the saddle lines. And this behavior is not just specific for this many body model. It's actually also appears in holographic theory. For example, uh, a ADS-CFT system where in the box is stringy system. So it ha both has screen mode and pure gravity mode. And there, uh, um, this HH propagator is in this form, and we have already explained this exponent. This alpha is a string of prime, this mu is a, the curvature correction, and it also has this C of P function. Um, in that case, the saddle point versus pole contribution to this squamping has some physical meaning in the box. In the box, the O stands for the contribution from graviton exchange, pure graviton exchange. And uh, the saddle point represents the stringy corrections or string 
or long string contribution to the scrambling. Um, and uh, early on, we see this picture that at small x over t is dominated by this saddle point, and at larger x over t is dominated by the graviton. That's because from the box case, there is an intuitive picture because green, um, when you be, uh, when the time becomes longer and longer, you excite more and more modes. Green expands as a function roughly like square root of. And graphon is like ballastic tra uh, transport. So it's just propagator, propagate linear in T. For small t, the square root of t is larger than linear in T. And that will be dominated by this. But the graphon propagate like later on, it's uh, a <laughs> process. Okay, so we just expand one feature and the other feature, oh, by the way, uh, since the uh, stringy mode is actually will be the same as a high temperature case we just talked about. From now on, we are just trying to focus on the pole or the graph case. And uh, there is another feature in the previous formula. We just expand this guy. There is this phase factor. And uh, this phase factor can also have a important uh, for example, if you compute instead this double commutator, which is uh, the same question here, um, you expand it, it has four terms, and two of them it's out of time ordered, which is dominant at day time. So these are the two terms. And you can find that because of this phase factor, these two terms actually has, have a phase difference. And for example, for this case, this, the phase difference of this guy. And this factor in the bracket also have a zero at the same place of this C of P function. So the pole of this integral actually get canceled if you compute the auto, the, the commutator of this. Um, okay, so these are the difference in the low temperature versus high temperature. And now it's straightforward. We just do the same computation. But we notice that there is a there is a, a key role played by this double Schrodinger critic contour because this field theory live on this double contour. When you consider the intermediate interaction point, you have to sum over different contour twice. And uh, for for example, for this diagram or that diagram, these are the two contour twice, and you'll find that. The propagator from the black dot to the intermediate red dot is exactly this commutator OD. So actually what happens is for low temperature system, this loop diagram can be formed in the sense that the early part of this scrambling is a double commutator OTOC, and later is OT. So that make a difference in the computation we, uh, we did earlier. So earlier we do the computation basically by integrating this intermediate point along the past butterfly cone of this final point. And now the difference is this propagator is still given by the saddle point contribution. So the same as the high temperature case, but this butterfly cone is defined by a different propagator. It's defined by this propagator dominant by the pole. And we just said the butterfly velocity for the pole dominant propagator is much larger. So you actually integrate over this like darker butterfly uh, backward, the butterfly cone. And uh, the early contribution, the butterfly cone is actually here. Okay. So you can imagine that uh, the situation could be different because remember the physical interpretation for this computation is basically you ask what the probability for this particle to hit this edge of this cone. And now this edge of cone moves much faster than the earlier case. It's much harder to, for this particle to reach that wall. And if you do the computation, that's exactly the case. So again, we get some formula like this. And now the point is this R parameter, because it's dominated by this pole, it will not depend on x and t. And uh, it's the R parameter will always be finite along the butterfly cone. And uh, that means the corrections will always be suppressed 
um, before the single scrambler answer become all the one. So that's different from the early case. And uh, that's a side remark. By no means I'm claiming the butterfly cone is sharp in the graviton theory or the pole dominant theory. There will be other fractions, but they will be much milder. Uh, I think today we will not have time to remark on that, but if you are interested, uh, ask me afterwards. And let me try to conclude. I'm almost running out of time. So what do we do today? We studied a specific type of quantum fluctuations in scrambling, which rep represents by these loop diagrams. And this fluctuation can cause a very significant, significant in a sense that is non partitive in N, very significant breakdown of the single scramble propagator in high temperature or saddle point dominant theory. That's the uh, first case we studied in the Brownian model. But what we see is this fluctuation becomes suppressed or cut it off by the pole contribution or the graviton contribution in low temperature system. Um, and uh, the way it cut, gets cut it off, very subtle. You have to be careful about this double ringer curtis contour. You have to care about the phase. You care, care about the sum over contours. So it's actually in a very subtle way. And uh, I actually have never explained what that's coherent and incoherent means. And uh, this computation actually suggests that there could be two different mechanisms for scrambling. Um, one is like this saddle point dominant one. And uh, actually not us, I think it's Kidaev and collaborators call it uh, incoherent scrambling. And I think it's uh, incoherent in the sense that you actually can view that as some classical process. You just propagate from here to there with some probability and from the intermediate point to the final. But uh, there is another different mechanism for low temperature or the pole dominant region. You can see that it's, it cannot be interpreted as this classical process in the sense that some over different contour will have some quantum interference. So in that sense, it's more coherent. And uh, um, these two different scrambling, well, they are quantitatively different at a leading order or at tree level. But uh, it's not that qualitative, even. but uh, by studying fluctuations, at least for the example today, you can see there is a sharp difference between them. One of them have a non perturbative breakdown, while the non perturbative breakdown is absent in the pole down case. And, uh, um, right. and uh, if you want to ask what's the uh, more intuitive difference between these two cases. I think the short answer is we don't know. This is the first evidence for this sharp difference. But uh, at least for now, as far as I know, there is not an intuitive picture for this coherent scrambling or the graviton whole dominant scrambling. And uh, let me end my talk here. <laughs>